Bill C-58 is a regressive piece of legislation that needs to be abandoned. Tonight, how First Nations will be affected by legislation to overhaul access to information. Yukon's mining sector reacts to the Supreme Court ruling in the fight to protect the Peel River watershed. I have done so, like so much work on me too that um, I needed that space for me. Um, and then now I regret that. And we'll take you to Thunder Bay for the hearings at the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. The Assembly of First Nations meeting starts tomorrow in Ottawa, but things began today inside Parliament. As several leaders expressed opposition to Bill C-58. It's legislation to overhaul access to information. As APTN's Todd Lamoran reports, critics say it will make research into specific land claims more difficult. In my view, Bill C-58 is certainly a gift from the ghost of Christmas past. Several leaders joined NDP MP Murray Rankin in condemning the proposed legislation. Despite the profound effect that this bill will have on First Nations' ability to get information about claims, disputes and grievances, they were not consulted. Union of BC Indian Chiefs Vice President Bob Chamberlain singled out one change in particular, where information requests must have precise times and topics or risk being rejected. So this government's pursuit now of having very specific asks being the requirement leads it to a greater opportunity for the rejection of the access to information. And by rejecting that access, rejects the opportunity for reconciliation and justice to be realized for First Nations people in Canada. The Scotland chief, Judy Wilson, said doing nothing would be better. So if we're, I'm trying to settle a claim, they're going to put up more barriers, bureaucratic barriers, that my claim will not be uh, settled. I will not get access to that information. They've put a th more of a tier process into to limiting that access to information. So that's why it's actually worse than the status quo. Bill C-58 is a regressive piece of legislation that needs to be abandoned. The bill is going into third reading before going on to the Senate. And when it goes into the Senate, we're going to be putting all our efforts into the Senate level to actually call for withdrawing or killing this bill. Chief Wilson will introduce opposition to Bill C-58 this week in Ottawa as a resolution at the AFN Special Chiefs Assembly. Todd Lamoran, APTN National News, Ottawa. Today was the first day of the trial for Thunder Bay's Chief of Police. J.P. Levesque has been charged with obstruction of justice and breach of trust. Kenneth Jackson was in the courtroom for today's testimony. He joins us now from Thunder Bay. Kenneth, thanks for taking the time to join us. Can you fill us in on what you heard in court today? Well, today, uh, Jean-Paul Levesque, uh, on the Thunder Bay Police Chief, uh, was in trial. It was day one. He was charged back in May. Everyone's kind of waiting for the trial to happen. Today was day one, as I said. And it started out, we heard more about uh, the, on the RCMP and Thunder Bay Police and their involvement, even though the OPP laid the charges, but particularly the, uh, on the involvement of J.P. Levesque. Now, what happened was that there was a complaint that came forward, uh, um, you know, basically alleging that uh, Mayor Keith, uh, I'm sorry, that the, uh, the Mayor Keith Hobbs of Thunder Bay was trying to extort the, on this lawyer and uh, didn't like it, had these videos and was involved somehow. So he went to the RCMP, he didn't trust Thunder Bay police, so he went to the RCMP and gave a statement, a video statement recorded all that. The RCMP realizing that it involves this uh, charges against this lawyer, Sandy Zaitsev, went to the Thunder Bay police on, on December 14th of last year and uh, told him uh, basically, you know, this is the case we have against, uh, our, our story. this is like the complainant we have, and uh, you guys need to, you know, deal with this probably, because it kind of involves your case against sites that have more than anything else. It was decided then that maybe the OPP should be called in, but they hadn't been yet. They were waiting for a transcript of his complainant's uh, testimony, our witness, or sorry, interview, uh, to be uh, given from the RCMP Thunder Bay Police. During that time, Mayor, uh, sorry, the Mayor Keith Hawes was uh, found out. He found out that, uh, that he was a target of an investigation for extortion, which is quite extraordinary. 
Uh, so the RCMP called J.P. Levesque, the, uh, you know, the chief of uh, Thunder Bay Police, and said, hey, we got an issue here. There's a leak in your, on your uh, on department. The, our, our target knows he's being investigated. What are you doing? He goes, actually, I'm the one who told him. I'm the one who told him he's a target. And that's kind of on the bombshell today. And that's the breach of trust charge, I'm assuming, on the Crown trying to lead to, that um, the chief of police gave the mayor confidential information that he was a target of an extortion investigation. Now, Kenneth, uh, the mayor's name, uh, Keith Hobbs, came up a lot today. He's also facing charges. These are, are different incidents, though. Yes, he's he's basically being. Uh, 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 sorry, like yeah, like he's charged with extortion or, or uh, trying to extort the, on the lawyer. It's a complicated, messy situation and a lot of moving parts. But I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Essentially, the mayor had these videos, gave them to this lawyer who was I'm then charged with sex crimes as a minor, and and basically wanted him to buy this house for uh, for his ex girl uh, for the lawyer's ex girlfriend. And said, you know, you're in a lot of trouble. If you know, I, 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 uh, excuse me, you don't want you don't want these videos coming out. So that's kind of the extortion side of things. And and you know, in doing so, the um, the mayor uh, employed this Canadian war veteran to give the, on the lawyer these videos. And that's kind of where they started to unravel. So it all kind of starts with this lawyer, and then reaches into the mayor, and then reaches into the chief. And that's what, kind of where we're at right now. And Kenneth, what, how serious are these charges that the Thunder Bay police chief are facing right now? Well, you have a uh, well, you had a sitting chief. He's still chief, but he's uh, basically on leave. You have a chief of police charged with uh, breach of trust and obstruction. Uh, it's pretty serious. It's not. It doesn't happen all the time. Uh, I would. I you know there are CMP. In their testimony today, there was multiple guys who testified, our, our members testifying, and they were shocked. They said shocked. They were stunned when they learned that Levesque gave Mayor Hobbs the, that info, that he was a target of an investigation. It doesn't happen. That's not supposed to happen. That's not how investigations are, um, you know, work. Hobbs, you know, is the mayor, but he also used to be a staff sergeant with the Thunder Bay Police Service as well for 34 years. He was the president of their union, that, or, you know, their association, that sort of thing. There's a connection there, and, you know, I'm not saying that's why he told them, but I'm just saying there's, there's a lot of history there. So it's, it's a pretty serious charge, uh, breach of trust, and um, it, um, the trial is unfolding all week. I'm not sure how much longer it's going to be going on, but, um, yeah, no, it's a serious charge. Kenneth, thanks for filling us in. Uh, looking forward to hear what comes out the rest of the week here. Thank you. To Winnipeg now, where a resident found a disturbing letter in the mail. With more, here's our colleagues at CTV Winnipeg. Tashi McKay says the first piece of mail he received at his new home was anything but welcoming. A uh, suspicious character walking up to the mailbox and uh, putting the letter in and I stopped nothing of it. When he opened the letter, he says he found a handwritten page full of racist comments directed to his landlord about tenants in the house. That being the place where I'm trying to spend time, more time with my son, and uh, I know it's just disappointing. I'm just disappointed in, uh, in humanity, pretty much. David Wachowski lives in the area and says it's horrible, but he isn't surprised. There's a lot of racism and misunderstanding everywhere to, and lack of compassion towards each other. Um, and you can just walk out on the streets and go downtown and see that anytime. As Department Chair of Indigenous Studies at the University of Winnipeg, Jacqueline Romano has recorded countless testimonies from students about their experience with racism. Romano says it's a widespread issue in Winnipeg and Manitoba. As a society, we've recognized that racism is a bad thing um, in every case except for Indigenous people. An attitude Romano calls pervasive and damaging. Once that starts happening to you, it's hard not to be a little bit afraid. It's hard not to be a little bit anxious. McKay says he's experienced racism for most of his life but wishes people could see the bigger picture. You gotta stop looking at people as races or religions or creeds. You gotta see people as people and respect them. Gabrielle Marchand, CTV News, Winnipeg.
To the Yukon now, where those with local mining interests are reacting to the Supreme Court of Canada's ruling last week that removes most of the Peel watershed from contention for exploration and development. The top court ruled the Yukon government must consider a 2011 land use plan that would see 80% of the watershed protected. Shirley McLean has more. Mining and mineral exploration has always been the Yukon's bread and butter. The Peel River watershed covers 26,000 square miles in the northeast part of the territory. It's an area rich in minerals and untouched beauty. It's also an area where thousands of claims have been staked. Last week, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that an 80% chunk of the watershed has to be protected. Samson Hartland is the head of Yukon's Chamber of Mines. He says he respects the High Court's decision but says there is concerns. He says 17% of Yukon's total land mass is already off limits to mineral exploration. Puts us at the highest in the country for land set aside for mineral exploration. So our concern is given this fact and given that there are five more land use plans to go, uh, the trajectory that we're on is, is very disconcerting in the investment community. Hartland says whether or not claim owners will be compensated still needs to be answered. The reality is, is uh, the claim for expropriation of, of those mining uh, operations or exploration uh, operations are very real possibilities. Of course, it's early days, so we'll see where this all goes, but uh, expropriation is something that could land in the courts down the road. This is going to be expensive. Yukon's this Premier Sandy Silver says process, those questions can be answered after consultation happens with Yukon First Nations. We'll have to work forward once we finish the consultation process and once the final plan is finalized. Then, then we can answer those questions about the what-ifs uh, that happens after that with uh, any of the claims that are inside yeah, that, that area. Really Silver says his government welcomes the court decision because it gives the government and mining industry clarity in how to proceed with land use planning in the territory. Shirley McLean, EPTN National News, Whitehorse. The National Inquiry started hearings in Thunder Bay today. We'll have the latest after the break. Stick around. Here's a look at Tuesday's weather forecast starting on the east coast. Cloudy and plus two in Halifax, Charlottetown and St. John's. Sunny and minus 9 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, minus 6 under the sun in Cartwright. A rainy day in Montreal and a high of plus 9. Rain and 5 above in Quebec City. Cloudy day across southern Ontario, 9 above in Toronto and Ottawa, 8 in Peterborough. Plus 1 and snow in Wawa, minus 6 in Sioux Lookout with snow. Over to Manitoba, minus 14 in Churchill. Sunny and 13 in Thompson and Flin Flon. Snow and minus 12 in Barron's River. Sunny and minus 9 in Dauphin and Winnipeg. In Saskatchewan, a sunny high of minus 9 for Estevan, minus 7 in Regina, minus 14 in LaRange and Uranium City. Welcome back. Manitoba RCMP confirmed the body of a missing 17-year-old female from Garden Hill First Nation was found over the weekend. The girl was reported missing on November 30th. She was last seen the day before. RCMP have not released the name, but on social media, community members have identified her as Treasure Harper. RCMP say they believe she was trying to walk from Garden Hill to the neighboring community of Wasagamack. No foul play is suspected. Garden Hill Search and Rescue found the girl approximately 16 kilometers northwest of the community on Saturday. Footprints by the hydro line, the north side of the community of Garden Hill, by the islands. <clears throat> That's where we've seen her footprints. Footprints. And it got too late that that evening. It got too dark because it was covered with snow. The tra the the tracks, the footprints, <clears throat> couldn't see it. So we had to wait till morning to start again. Losing traditional languages is an issue many Indigenous communities struggle with. As fluent speakers age and less young people pick up their language, Six Nations Polytechnic is trying to change that with a new app. Beverly Andrews reports. 
Our language is important. Loss of language is a loss of culture. And for many, learning and practicing their traditional language can be a challenge. Six Nations Polytechnic recently launched a new Mohawk language app, which makes learning it accessible outside of the classroom. It's vital to who we are as Ongoehoe, to who we are, like no matter where you're coming from, because your language holds so much of your perspective, your world perspective, uh, and your cultural perspective. Alyssa General is a speaker on the app. She wants to help future generations learn the language. The app was initially developed to support existing programming, but it can be used by anyone who wants to speak Mohawk. There's a sense of kindness and, and helpfulness in the app for students who are sometimes struggling. It might be their first time learning a language, so it gives them a way to hear and to see it and to, to learn a little bit about a bit more about it. There are individual words, phrases, and games. The app can be used on its own or as a study aid for students earning a Bachelor of Arts degree in either Kuga or Mohawk. An app is a tool. It definitely, you, you do have to still put in time to learn language, to acquire it, and to, to produce it. Mohawk is an endangered language, but tools like this make the language more accessible to people who may not have the community to immerse themselves in. If you use the app, it becomes a lot easier. <laughs> because if you can't practice, you can't improve. It's how we relate to the, like, how we relate to the world around us. And it's all embedded in our language. So it's in, in, important and crucial to be carrying that on to future generations, to be able to see things through the eyes of our ancestors. Six Nations Polytechnic also launched a Speak Kuga app in 2016. Both apps are free to download to iPhone or Android devices. Beverly Andrews, APTN National News, Six Nations of the Grand River. Great use of technology. There's, uh, we got to take another quick break, but there's more to come. Stick around. Here's the rest of Tuesday's weather outlook. Picking back up in northern Alberta, sunny and minus two in Peace River. In southern Alberta, three above in Calgary and Lethbridge, plus four in Medicine Hat. On the west coast, sunny and plus eight in Tofino, plus seven in Victoria and Port Hardy. Minus two in Smithers and Fort Nelson, plus four under the sun in Fort St. John. A mild day in Yukon, plus one in Whitehorse, minus three in Beaver Creek. Nice across parts of NWT, minus four in Trout Lake and Norman Wells. Minus 19 in Saks Harbor, minus 21 under the sun in Fort McPherson. In Nunavut, minus 23 in Repulse Bay and Cambridge Bay. Sunny and minus 2 in Aglulik on Tuesday, minus 13 under the sun in Cape Dorset. Welcome back. Now to our continuing coverage of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Today, hearings began in Thunder Bay. Fifty family members and survivors are expected to testify. Anita Ross was the first family member to give testimony this morning. Willow Fiddler reports. The feather Anita Ross is holding was gifted to her by an elder. That was over a year ago when her daughter Delaine Copanes was missing. He said, think of it as your daughter. Delaine Copanes was last seen on February 27, 2016 in downtown Kenora. Her mother and sister reported her missing six hours later. I never honestly had to worry about her because I knew she was always there. Ross recalled the heartbreaking details searching for her 16-year-old daughter. She criticized police for not being more sincere in their search efforts. I said, we have to work together. This is my daughter. And then I even told them, this is your daughter now. I even gave them tobacco. And I told them, please help me find my daughter. Several weeks after she went missing, a body was discovered in Lake of the Woods. And he told me it's Delaine. Yeah. <sighs> 
I start to scream. I was like, no. Ross said she was surprised when the police and coroner told her there was no foul play and that her death was ruled an accidental drowning. She still had pink in her lips. She wasn't blue. She wasn't bloated. She had a bruise right on her forehead right here. But Ross doesn't believe Delane drowned or that her death was an accident. My theory is I believe somebody hurt my baby. To date, close to 600 people in seven inquiry hearings have testified in public and private hearings and with statement gatherers. And commissioners say they've heard the same concerns about police investigations that Ross expressed. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of concerns about uh, policing, police investigations, uh, the response time to um, people raising concerns about their loved ones being missing. So we've been hearing these sorts of truths across the country in various locations. The commissioner said they will be gathering more evidence from families and the police themselves before making any recommendations to address the concerns. The hearings continue until Wednesday. Willow Fiddler, APTN National News, Thunder Bay. The inquiry also heard today from Crystal Davey, who shared stories of two of her family members. Her mother, Ruby Ann Hardy, went missing in British Columbia in 1998. This past summer, her brother died. His death is being investigated as a homicide. They said, we don't know what to do with him. And I thought he had really good insight. He was able to um, say to me, you know, we were at a hockey game and he said, it's very busy in here. I'm feeling very overwhelmed. So we left. So at that time, he asked if he could come live with me. Um, and I couldn't. And I said... I'd be happy to bring you to Thunder Bay and find you a place. I can't, I, I've done so, like so much work on me too that um, I needed that space for me. Um, and then now I regret that. Um, so he continued to live in BC um, and struggled on his own. And, and I, I'm not sure what happened to him in those home, in that home, but, um, this, uh, this summer, uh, he, he was murdered and, um, I can't talk about it because it's an open case, but, um, his alleged murderer is out on bail. Um, and I don't understand that. And I feel like I wish I could have done more for him and my life compared to his life are so different. And that could have been my life, because I'm lucky to have supports and people that are there for me. That is your APTN National News for this Monday. For news anytime, including more on the National Inquiry, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night.